السلام عليكم and welcome to part 3 of Al Janaza talk. The Jewish wash, the body, the physical wash of a dead corpse is not in the Torah. So where does it come from? Well, as it turned out that either traditional or the secular scholars, they all agree that the ritual washing of a dead corpse was devised and understood by the rabbis when they study at Talmud. And then they said that, say, a Talmud, by the way, is like for us the Sunnah, the Hadith, all that kind of stuff. However, as is the case with us, there is a disagreement about the origins and meanings of these practices. And the Jewish, they give different interpretations to different events. For example, the Jewish burial tradition, they all gave or they all give a great reverence for both the body and the spirit of a person who has died. The initial thought is this. The Jewish people uphold the belief that a human being, that man, that the human being, has been created in the image of God. In other words, to them, Allah has two hands, two arms, two legs, a butt, and a tummy, and all these things. So when a person was alive, they embodied the spirit of God. Of course, we Muslims, we also say this. We just say it differently. Our sheikhs, they say, Al insan fihi The human being has got a spirit blow, the divine spirit blow in him. However, the Jewish tradition also likens the human physique the body to a Torah scroll. They say the human body is like the page that carries the text of the Torah or like the Quran. Yeah, when a person or when the page of the Torah was in good conditions, it served a good purpose, it carries the Torah. But when it becomes damaged, we cannot dispose of it as we would dispose any other piece of paper. A page that has Torah in it must be disposed in a respectful manner. And this is why the Jewish people do what they do to the corpse, to someone who died, because when this person was alive, they embodied the spirit of God. When they died, we cannot dispose of him as we would dispose of somebody else. So we must take good care of him. And this is where all the elements that the Jewish people do, it's because of this. They have also another strange belief, really. They believe that when somebody dies, even though the soul has quitted the body, is no longer with him, but the soul has not completely gone. They believe that the soul will stand hovering over the corpse in which it once lived for between one day to seven days. From one day to seven days. This is why the Jewish have this practice where they call for someone to sit and watch over the body. And they have rewards for it for the hereafter. Things like that. So when a person is dead, they are never left alone. There is always somebody. Why? They believe because in the same room as the alive person is seated, the corpse is there. It's aware of what's happening around him. They are aware that they have died. Their soul is hovering above. The physique and the soul are extremely scared. And they need support, help, guidance, uh, tapping on the shoulder. It's always going to be fun. And that's why people stay and watch over the deceased person. That's what the Jews believe, anyway. So, Sheikh Si, Sheikh Du. Our sheikhs back in the 3rd century, they saw how the Jewish people buried their deads. And so many of the practices of the Jews find themselves into our Islam and all our sheikhs needed to give a real presence to these things and reason to be part of our Islam is to invent a hadith Qudsi and that's our normal hadith narrative and you have it. Our janazah, we have a person who dies. They are taken to the masjid to bathe this, this person to clean them. Question is, why do we wash a dead corpse? It's dead. And we're going to put him in the ground where it's dead. 
The moment we put him, the bacteria inside them, the worms of the earth will start eating the body. Why do we wash a deceased person? What's the Once we know why, we will find that the janaza that we do is actually an act which not only contradicts the Qur'an, but accused the Qur'an of lying. It's, it's really, I know to you, is, 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 what is he on about? But please bear with me and keep listening. And you will see what I, uh, what I mean by that. The reason why we wash the body comes from this point. The belief that a human being, I'm talking about the Muslim here, I'll finish the Jews, you, now you understand more about what the Jews do, we're going to speak about us. What we believe in is that when a person dies, they actually haven't fully died. When we take them to the graveyard, two angels will come and will give life back to this person for questioning. So the washing is not to wash the corpse, it's to prepare it to meet the angels. <laughs> It's strange, isn't it? You never thought of it like that. But I'm telling you, the, the life that they say, we live on earth. When we die, we go to a new life called the Barzakh life, or life in the Barzakh. The Barzakh is the in-between worlds, between our world and the world to come. There is another world where the souls will be there awaiting judgment day. So in the world of a human, Islam, yeah, they say that, <laughs> it is Allah's wisdom that he gave each, and this is, I took this from Islam QA again. He says, the Sheikh there, he says that Allah has given each human being four lives. And I want you to pay attention to this. Four lives. The Quran says different, but we're gonna, later on you're going to see how many lives Allah gave us. He says, in the womb of the mother there is one life. Okay. And then we have the worldly life. Number two is the life we live on earth. All right. The third life is the in-between world's life in the Barzakh. And the fourth life is the life in the hereafter. Our sheikhs, Muslims unquestionably believe that when someone dies, when a Muslim person dies, they are headed to a new life, a life of bliss, or a life of punishment, which are dependent on their actions. And this fate shall depend on the outcome of their actions and how they answer the two angels. Muslims, we believe that when a person dies, his soul straight away is taken all the way to Allah. The soul is taken all the way to... If when I lost my son, let's say he died now, Right when he died, his soul, that's what we preach, his soul gets taken all the way to Allah, and Allah will tell them, return my servant's soul back to earth. Judgment day hasn't occurred. And then when he goes to, back to the grave, it is returned into his body, and he will awake for questioning by the two angels. The awakening of the human inside the grave is real, just like when you wake up every morning. And that is why we wash our deaths. Because we don't want him to, when they wake up, they stink or are dirty, but we want him to be in the best of forms, in the best of shapes, and that is why when we put our dead in the grave, we remove the shroud, the white shroud, the piece of clothes from their head so that they can talk to the angels. That's what we believe in. Abu Huraira reports in a hadith narrative that the messenger said when a person dies and is buried, already, and then two angels shall come to him. One of them is called Al-Munkar, and the other one is called Al-Nakir. Al-Munkar and Al-Nakir is from, uh, they are so scared that you get denied your own emotions when you hear them. And then they will ask the person four questions. Who is your God? And the person will answer. 
Of course, the hadith goes into details. The believer says, my God is Allah. I had people telling me, please write to me the answers I should give in the grave. And that is disturbing. But anyhow, question number one, who is your God? And then you got to tell them the answer. Point number two, what is your religion? And you got to tell them Islam and blah, blah, blah. Question number four, go online and type answers to the questions in the grave and you will get tons of them question number three what do you say about the man who was sent to you muhammad and you gotta tell them he's the prophet of allah he's the a human being the prophet of allah blah 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 and number four is how do you know all of this how do you know that and the books of hadith of course tell you or sometimes people answer the questions right but how do you know about these things they will answer that question wrong and if they answer it wrong all the other questions are deemed wrong so the reason behind all the rituals of the janaza that we muslims observe are to serve one purpose and one purpose only the encounter of the two angels that's it <laughs> of course they, uh, for their questioning so the hidden message of the janazah today is that we want to send our dead off and before sending him off to meet his fate and the angels we prepare the body for his resurrection in the grave and of course if the person says well they're gonna enjoy in the grave a life of goodness and if they are bad they're gonna be punished in the grave but this raises a very interesting question if the person is gonna be asked in the grave about their deeds and they answer and they're gonna enjoy in life right okay I'm gonna be, be having fun why is it then on judgment day Allah will hold him accountable again the person has already succeeded the person knows their fate they know their end why do they have to go all the way back to square one again on judgment today and if the person has spent thousands of years in the punishment of the grave why are they scared on judgment day that they're gonna be judged and they don't know what their fate is it does, just doesn't make sense if we are to believe what the Salafi cult says about our death then we are in the wrong religion as that preached by the Quran you see Allah has in the Quran yeah, endlessly instructed us to believe in the last day resurrection day accountability day judgment day rewards day and the list goes out to a staggering number did you know that, that there is a mention 114 times of the name last day you believe in Allah and the last day Allah had mentioned this 114 times the name of Al Qiyama the day when we stand up from our deaths we stand up is mentioned 70 times the word resurrection when we are resurrected from death is mentioned 60 times and Allah has given an Al-Quran 27 more other descriptions of what is going to take place on judgment day all these elements will get erased by the Janazah funerals because the moment we believe that Allah is going to resurrect the dead in the grave ask them four questions and then punish them for eternity we have actually we don't need to believe in judgment day our life begins and ends in the grave my dear sisters and my brothers the huge majority of the believers today Muslims are blindly believing and following without even asking the most basic question why we are doing the janaza they are taking granted what every man of religion says out there and what the janaza is doing is a constant reminder that we the muslims do not trust in allah's quran and are following a corrupt islam because janaza is not a religious deed but rather a cultural deed you see when Allah has created each and every human with the same components 
And the same way, he created each and every single human from the earth. None of us is created from anything else. And then from that sperm of the woman and the man, a human being comes to earth. Not only that, we all come from the same orifices. We all were born through the same canal, the mothers. None of us, no matter their religious status, even that of a prophet or a messenger, has been delivered any different. Even Jesus, son of Mary, who didn't have a father, was born through the same canal. And because we all decompose in the same manner, if we there is a scholar, this man is a is, is great scholar of Islam. When they talk about him, he's a huge big scholar. He lived in the second century and died in the third. He was the teacher of a great Imam called a Shafi'i. A Shafi'i is the man who single-handedly destroyed Islam by making the Sunnah the uh, equal to the Quran. This, that's the man, that's the culprit, that's the, 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 the man, the, the guilty one. Wakia, the teacher of a Shafi'i, is praised, but he is not spoken of, his hadiths don't get mentioned, and he is completely ignored for one reason. Because he mentioned a hadith that the messenger of Allah was buried three days after his death, not in the same 24 hours, three days later, and the body of the messenger, because of the heat, had started decomposing, and the, bo and the, the, the body of the messenger got swollen, inflated. That's what happens, bacteria. Because of this hadith, this man got completely removed from the face of Islam forever. Because if they bring him forth, they're going to bring that hadith and the Salafi cult don't want anything that would put the Prophet Muhammad in any other part. So that's the problem we have today. Janaza, as I said, is a cultural, not religious deed. We all have been created the same and we all should be given the same scent of when done, it's left to families and members. You see, each religion today doesn't want to mix its followers with the other whom they consider kuffar. The Jewish people consider anyone else apart from the Jews as kafir. Christians, the same thing. We, same thing. Hindus, the same thing. Each one of us is happy with where they are. But Allah didn't ask us to do that. Had we followed the teachings and instructions of the Quran, our graveyards, our cemeteries would have been home to all kinds of humans. Jewish, Christian, pagans, I don't care what you are. I'm talking to you from the ground of you being a human being created the same way as the other human beings. And when you die, your physique, your body gets put back to the earth from which you came, regardless of the thoughts and beliefs you had. Because Allah teaches us in the Quran that as a single race, all humans are on earth to get to know each other, work with each other for the greater good that will benefit each and every single one of them. Ya ayyuhan nas, O you people, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha. We have created you from a male and a female. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا And we made you into nations and the tribes لِتَعَارَفُوا So that you get to know each other. And then Allah establishes the difference between us. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Indeed, the noblest of you are those who are mindful of Allah. Please notice how Allah said, عِنْدَ Allah, with Allah. I am not here to judge who is pious and who is not. If, I, if a pious Muslim is walking down the street and he sees, for example, a road collision, two cars have collided with each other and people are injured. A Muslim person, a pious person who is so observant of Allah's laws, goes and the, on the other hand, another man comes in and the other man smells of alcohol. To a pious person, they should not care about the other person smelling alcohol. They should concentrate on saving the injured ones. I don't care about who you are, what you are, or if you are a woman or if you are an old man. 
if you are wearing gold or you have a beard or not beard these are irrelevant to saving a life and this is what Allah wants from us your belief your faith keep it to yourself but with the humanity interact to get to know each other even at the time of the messenger there were different people living with different people as I said before there were the Arabs there were the pagans there were the Jews there were the Christians there were all kinds and all types of people yet when when Allah wanted to forbid the mingling of the believers with other believers he put one conditions look what Allah says وَقَدْ نَزَّلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الْكِتَابِ and Allah has descended upon you in the book in the Quran in the law and إذا سمعتم آيات الله يكفر بها that whenever you hear the ayat the text of Al-Quran ayat الله the ayat of Allah be that in the Quran be that in the Torah be it, are made in fun of and disbelieved of for us Muslims if you're sitting together and one of us started mocking up the, the, the gospel of the Torah we must do this فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعَهُمْ You must not stay with them until they engage in another topic. Should you stay with them? You therefore become like them. Indeed, Allah will gather the hypocrites and the disbelievers all together in hellfire. What Allah is saying here is this. You Muslim are living in a multi-different society. Of all kinds of people mingling with others living with them discussing with them sitting chatting having a coffee with them is fine but as soon as any of these people start mocking up Allah's books that he descended Allah says you straight away stand up and leave them don't get back to them until they change the course of their conversation when they do go back and sit with them because if you sit with them you will become like them a mocker and a hypocrite and then Allah says that Allah will gather the hypocrites and the disbeliever in her fire altogether notice how Allah only asked us to leave a people when they mock the books he sent down he didn't tell us don't talk to the Christians he didn't Allah didn't tell us isolate yourself from the Jews Allah didn't tell us hate the Hindus Allah didn't say to us mock the the, 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 the Hare Krishnians or the, the Sikh or the Buddhists or anybody no Allah tells us mingle with them talk with them discuss but the moment they start mocking up religion stand up and go they stop go back it is the sheikhs who have created of us and from us masters we only talk to Muslims we only sit with Muslims and they invented this vile law loving for the sake of Allah and hating for the sake of Allah Allah didn't ask us to love and hate for his eh? all he asked is I created you from a male and a female I made you into nations and people so that you get to know each other and help each other for the greater good fine good and if one of you mocks my religion stand up don't sit with them how is Allah asking me to love for the sake if Allah wanted me to hate for his sake he would never ever have allowed me to marry a Jew or a Christian a female who marries a male fine a male who, it doesn't matter but as long as I'm gonna go with the less controversial issue yeah? one day I'll talk about women marrying non-muslim but for now let's say I have a Muslim man who marries a Jewish woman or I'm, I'm gonna go with Christian with a Christian religious woman a hardcore religious woman that woman wears the cross will have in her house a place where plenty crosses she will pray to Allah and to Jesus Allah knows this yet he made it halal for me to marry her to fall in love with her to have babies with her and build a family with whom with the woman who says Jesus is son of God in his uh, in, in the house where the believer lives Allah is fine with that the sheikhs no how can you do that she's a mushrik you cannot marry her and and they bring you all these kind of confusing statements until your head becomes like a tank it crushes anything that doesn't go along with him my dear sisters and my brothers as I said the Janazah Salat is in summary in pure summary just a reminder that a human body will 
Muslim body. When we die, we are going to resurrect in the graves, and for that we need to be <laughs> a nice look. It's like you're going to a, a wedding or you have something important and you want to take a bath to look fresh, to look good, and to look that. There is another hadith by a Tirmidhi and authenticated by so many other scholars where they say that the messenger of Allah said, and I can guarantee my life, the messenger never said this rubbish. But hey, the people who came after him, they removed the Quran and then anything passed because the, the Quran is no longer the judge. But anyway, they say that the Rasulullah said, إِنَّمَا الْقَبْرُ وَرَوْضَةٌ مِنْ رِيَادِ الْجَنَّةِ the grave is either a garden from the gardens of paradise or a pit from the pits of hell fire. And this is rubbish, untrue. The qabr is just an opening back in the womb of the mother so that we put our body to easily, safely, healthily decompose and go back to how it was before. All that is it. You see, the people who believe that the deceased person will be visited by two angels and that person will be asked questions and they will answer and all these are people who at the same time say the Quran is a liar really he is a liar so these two angels to to make Muslims scared get scared and be more afraid they tell us that these two angels they are so black that they turned into blue and this is how black you can go. And of course, black here, as some people, they say, look, at Islam is racist. It makes the white uh, good and the black evil. So all black people are evil. No, it's got nothing to do with that. Except that, that always remember, Al-Quran talks to, to people with what they understand. We all know that daytime, we are far safer than nighttime. Back then, they didn't have the fancy schmancy uh, houses that we have today. Back then, snakes could sneak in through the, the, the door. They have scorpions. They have all these animals that can kill humans. Back then, daytime, they had a guarantee. They can see a snake. They can see a scorpion. They don't get attacked quickly and easily. But at night, at night, it's very dark. So before, they used to say, oh, oh, this is like the light. The light of the day, the darkness of the night. That's all there is to it. It's like we say today, how are you doing? Are you all right? All right is an indication of the good that exists in a human as opposed to the left. So it's, it's, it's got nothing of uh, racist uh, in one. But if we believe the hadith narratives, not only these hadith narratives are false, untrue and forged, but the idiots who lied to them and still believe in them today and do not question them, have absolutely no knowledge about what the Quran says. The Quran says things, it doesn't say things. These people really have no idea what the Quran says and if they knew, they would disregard it because to them an authentic hadith is far more potent, far more powerful than the Quran of Allah. And this is untrue. According to the hadith, we have three lives. The first one is in this life, from the moment we are conceived, born, and all the way until we die. That's the first life. To the Hadith people, the second life is what took, takes place in the grave. From the moment we are put in the grave, the angels will come, the soul will get back to us. It's either enjoyment or punishment. And the third life, they say, is when Allah resurrects us on judgment day. Yet, 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 Allah disapproves of this. Allah has said that the only thing He's given us, and He is the giver, are only two lives. Not three, not four. Two lives. Look to what Allah says. How can you apostatize in Allah? How can you not believe in Allah? And the kufr, by the way, my dear sisters and my brothers, is the act of deliberately choosing not to accept something you believe it's true. That is the covering. I believe that Al-Quran is the book from Allah and then I chose not to follow the Quran. This is the kufr. If you have a problem with, uh, you witnessed something happens in the street. Okay, we're going to take the road collision between two cars. You saw an accident. 
and there is a white car and there is a red car. The white car is the one who has who is the in the wrong, but the white car is driven by your brother. The red car is driven by somebody else. Now you are in a dilemma. If you speak the truth, you're gonna have your brother in deep problems, and if you lie, you're gonna save your brother. Now me, I'm gonna lie. The moment I lie, I have disbelieved in the truthfulness and not mistake and error or fault of the red car. I am a, the red car person would turn to me and he says, why are you disbelieving? Disbelieving meaning it's there to be believed, but I reject the belief in it. This is what the kufr means. So when Allah tells people, how can you this, i.e. reject the belief in Allah? It's not I don't believe, it's I reject the belief in Allah while fully being aware that I should believe in Allah and believe in Allah is the correct thing. And then Allah says, how can you not believe in Allah? How can you apostate in Allah? وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا And you were dead, i.e. the non-existence. If you look at your child of two, his children right now do not exist, but they exist in him. If I take the example of a woman, they tell us that a woman comes with a certain number of eggs. Well, then a woman since the young age comes with what can make babies. And if those eggs inside her get fecunded, by another sperm, the baby is born. So, right now, those little babies of your little child, they are considered dead, non-existent. And this is the first life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sorry, this is the first death. Allah says, وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتٍ And you were dead, non-existent. فَأَحْيَاكُمْ Then, He gives you life. He alived you. In other words, you and I, before coming to life, we were dead. Just like when they put us in the grave, we are dead until Allah gives us life in the hereafter. It's the same analogy. When we were not, when my mother was not married to my dad, I was dead in that realm. The moment they married, slept with each other, I was born. And then when I die, they put me in earth, I am detached from my reality until Allah gives me life again. So Allah talking to people who don't believe in him and he finds it extremely amazing that people don't believe in him after he has shown them all these things. How can you disbelieve in Allah and you were dead and then he alived you, he gave you life here, yeah, born to your parents. Then he will cause you to die. Like I buried my son, Allah caused him to die. And then, and then he alives you once more for resurrection death. So according to the Quran, we have two deaths, the one before our life and the one when we are in the grave. And we have two lives, the one after we are born and the one in resurrection day. This one is in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah 2, Ayah 29. On Judgment Day, when people are put in hellfire for punishment and they get there and they see the reality of thanks, oh my God, we lost, they start, you know, when, <laughs> when I was a kid and I get into trouble with my mother and I am punished and she's beating the hell out of me and me, I'm trying and then I start, uh, first I start crying, no, oh, please, da, 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 and then those things do not work. So I, I changed strategy and said, oh, mom, I love you. You are my best mom. Mom, I will do anything you say. You see how the bargain starts? Just I'm trying here to win her love, her, her good be, her good morals, her good attitude towards me. Well, in judgment day, when people are in hellfire, they are in hell and they're being punished. And now they want to beg of Allah to, let, to give them another opportunity, another chance, so that they don't do what they have done in the first time. They will say, Qalwa Rabbana, our Lord, they would say, thnatayni. You have died us, i.e. made us die, twice. And you, thnatayni, and you alived us, and you gave us lies, twice. Now while we are here in hellfire, we fully acknowledge our sins. We take responsibility for what we did. 
Now they have said this. And now they're going to make the request as to why they say that. They said, فَهَلْ إِلَى خُرُوجِ مِنْ سَبِيلِ Is there a way out? Please, is there any possibility of a way out? And of course, Allah is going to say no. Because you, you missed your opportunity. And this is in Surah Ghafir, the Surah number 40 and the Ayah 11. So here we see that the Quran states that when a human being exists, A, he is non-existent to the parents who didn't get married. And then Allah gives him life. And then the human being dies in the grave and Allah gives him a second life in the hereafter. Mr. Hadith and the Janazah say we have three lives. Yes, the Janazah says that the human being is going to the grave for his second life. As a matter of fact, there are even other hadith narratives which contradict completely the Quran. For example, one of them, and this one is a Muslim and an Nasai, so it's authentic. They tell you, oh, the Messenger of Allah had said that uh, in the night of Al Isra, when he traveled from Mecca to Palestine to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem up to the seven heavens and back to Jerusalem, back to Mecca, all the way either to or from Jerusalem, the Prophet said, I came. And in another narration, he said, I passed by Musa. And Musa was in his grave nearby a red mount. And I saw Musa standing, performing his salat. And this hadith authentic, and the sheikhs swear by it. So now I understand that Musa, who died thousands of years ago, actually is not dead. He is in his grave performing a salat. He is alive in the grave until judgment day and day. So Musa has three lives. And if this happened to Musa, it can happen to any other Muslim. So from here I understand that Musa had three lives. The life he lived, then he died, he resurrected, he's now busy praying, and then God knows what's going to happen to him, and then he can... You see how the hadith contradicts the Quran right in the face? You see, you see, you see what the problem is? And in st for the hadith to exist in Allah's Islam, the Quran must be removed. Nobody can give you a talk speaking about the lives because the moment you speak about how many lives we have and how many deaths you are, if you go the Quran way, we have two. Two deaths, two lives. You go the hadith way, we have three. And they cannot, the Quran cannot exist with al hadith. So we truly, truly, truly must understand and must believe Allah that when he tells us that from the earth he created us and to it he will return us and from it he will resurrect us another time, we're not going to be resurrected inside the earth. It's impossible. Minha khalaqnakum, from it we created you. Wafiha nu'idu, and in it we will return you and from it we will bring you out another time. In another ayah, Allah mentioned clearly to Muhammad that once somebody dies, they die for real. Innaka mayyitun. You, Muhammad, are indeed going to die. Wa innahum mayyitun. And they indeed are going to die. And then, yawm al-qiyamati, thumma innakum yawm al-qiyamati, then on the day of standing, of resurrection, before your Lord, you all shall settle your disputes. We die, Muhammad is dead like me, like him, like everyone else. The body gets decomposed back to earth. The soul gets stored elsewhere in the in-between world. And we are like that until Allah resurrects us on the new earth. And then we go in front there for accountability and uh, rewards and things like that. No three lives, no angels coming and asking nothing. As a matter of fact, Allah calls this life Al Hayat al Dunya, the lower life or the first life, and Al Hayat al Akhirah and the last life. We only have two lives. The, the whole, the whole concept of Islam evolves around believing in Allah and the last day. The whole concept. There is no life inside the earth. Janaza is here to tell us there is a third life.
Another lie that has been lied uh, upon the Prophet Muhammad is that they tell you every time a Muslim greets the messenger, Allah gives him his life to return your salam back on him. Every time you have that, the, 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 the famous sentence of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. The moment you say it, Allah gives life back to the Prophet and Muhammad will say, and upon you, Allah's mercy and salam. So if I say it in a minute, 60 times, the Prophet is Allah. This Prophet never died. Even though Allah told him, you are going to die and they are going to die. But our hadith tells us, no. Muhammad is never dead because every time one sends the greeting, Allah gives him back his soul and he will respond to, look, listen to this lie, not a Muslim greets me except that Allah will return to me my soul so that I return the greeting back to him. And this hadith is by Ahmed and Abu Dawood and authenticated by Al-Albani. So this is a hadith that the scholars, all of them believe in. Not a single scholar will belie this one, even if it contradicts the Quran 1000%. So my dear sisters, it's beyond belief that I can ascertain that the messenger of Allah never ever added such lies that I just mentioned about Musa, about Allah giving him back his life or anything like that. And anyone who believes that Allah keeps Muhammad alive to answer people when they do salat upon him, and that as consequence to that he never died, is a person that qualifies Allah as a liar. Allah said Muhammad is going to die, end of it. Why does Allah keep Muhammad uh, returning the soul to Muhammad to answer people back? Why is that? Is to show that Muhammad is a bigger shot than Jesus or what? The Janazah at its core, at the deepest of its core, is a direct attack on the Quran. The Quran says the body disintegrates back to dust. Janazah says no, the body goes and enjoys time in the grave till judgment day. The Quran says there, is n there are two lives. Janazah says there are three lives. The Quran says accountability takes place on judgment day. Janazah says no, accountability occurs in the grave. Even though Al Islam was completed while the Prophet was alive, we have this nonsense that attacks the Quran and confuses people to the core. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم in year 10 few weeks before the death of the messenger Allah says today I have concluded completed your religion for you وأتممت عليكم نعمتي and have terminated my favor upon you ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا and I am pleased for Islam as is now to be your religion this is in Ma'idah surah number 5 ayah number 3 and the reason we went wrong is because we have chosen to listen to the lies, the hadith narrative lies that were made up and invented hundreds of years later and ignored what Allah said and we ended up with this rubbish. What now? When I die, am I going to ask my children not to wash me, not to pray on me? I'm not. Because it has become so grinded in our psyche. If we hear someone didn't want to be washed and not, uh, people are going to just treat you as kafir. If you get buried in a Muslim cemetery, you are lucky. People will look, oh, your children will have difficult times. So what I would say from here is this. I, Abdul Salam, I'm not going to put my children through the agony of don't wash me, don't do this. I will tell them what janazah is and I leave it to them to send me off traditionally as they like. They want to pray janazah on me, they know uh, I don't care about it. But what matters is me, me, Abdul Salam. To me, janazah is wrong. The entire perception of janazah is based on false beliefs. That the person is going to be met by the two angels, the soul is going to go back to Allah, and the angel is going to see him, he's going to enjoy. All that is rubbish. When we die, we become piece of flesh, good for a lion to eat us, and then poop us. That's all we are. 
But because Allah doesn't want that, and we have memories, we have family, we have this and that, Allah asked us to bury our debts so that we feel good about ourselves. But as far as the dead person is concerned, we bury them, we burn them, we feed them to dogs, we feed them to snakes, it doesn't do anything to them. The body is back to where it belongs, to death. We were dead before creation, we, cre we came to this life, we lived our life, then we go back to how we were before our birth, so that we are ready for the resurrection that is to come. This, I will stop here, otherwise there is a lot to say, but uh, I think the message is here. Janaza, as it is, is a cultural thing, it's a social thing, but not a religious one. So on Judgment Day, when we go to Allah, we should not expect rewards for what we did. We just expect good feeling that we tried to do our best and put the person back on earth uh, in the best of manners. I pray to Allah this answers the question of uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the trigger question about the significance of washing a, a dead body, perfuming it and then burying it and all these things. Is there anything in the Quran about this? The answer is no. In an ideal world, this would have been sufficient. But we're not in an ideal world and I needed to speak three hours and uh, take uh, uh, I think 10 days or something to prepare in this what seems to be a simple talk but in fact it is not it's a disturbing talk Janaza is nothing but saying there are three lives when the Quran says there are only two I pray to Allah to guide us to listen to the Qur'an, to prioritize the Qur'an, to not let anyone come between us and the Qur'an. For on Judgment Day, when the Messenger will yell to Allah, my people have abandoned the Qur'an, Allah will just keep us apart, huge bunch of people there, the minority who have not done that to the Qur'an, come here and let the rest deal with the rest. As I said before, on Judgment Day, the only book of law that shall be there to which Allah will hold us accountable is the Qur'an. There is no Bukhari, there is no Muslim, there are no hadiths, absolutely not a thing will be there. If people think and believe that on Judgment Day they will expect and get rewards because they entered the toilet with the left foot and came out with the right, they are in for a huge surprise. That <laughs> I find this really amusing. They say it's a sunnah to enter the toilet to the left and come out to the right. Yet we all know that the time, uh, at the time of the messenger, throughout his life, he never peed or pooped in the toilet. They all go out in the wilderness, under the mountain, under the trees, find a secluded spot where nobody can see them, raise their uh, garments, do their deed and go home. There is no toilet to enter with the left and no toilet to, enter with, to come up to the right. So for a prophet who never walked into a toilet, that we find a hadith that tells us enter with your left foot to the toilet, is just an indication on how much the Quran means nothing to our sheikhs and to the Islam uh, that is today built on humans. One more time, Janaza has nothing to do with Islam. We shouldn't expect rewards from it on Judgment Day. We just should expect to feel good about what we did in this life. And I pray to Allah that because we bury our debts, we get a reward for that act. Other than that, please always bear in mind, Whatever people believe in that we're going to speak to the angels is nothing but calling Allah and the Quran liar and we're not of these people. Allah has always spoken the truth. The Quran is the light, the guidance, the truth and nothing of the wrong can come out of the Quran and all the evil comes out from the hadith narratives and sayings of the scholars. One more time, this is your brother Abdul Salam. I wish you all the best and I pray to Allah that I see you or you hear my voice again pretty much soon when I finish the talk about the high demonstration of women. That also is going to be a very interesting talk. Peace, uh, peace to you and be blessed and to you and your family. Assalamu alaikum.